Welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. I'm your host, Nicole, and this podcast is your guide to start creating a lifestyle by design. From entrepreneurship, money and finance, taxes and residencies, and everything in between, this show highlights the nuances of a true global citizen lifestyle. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. I am so looking forward to having you on the show today. Before we dive into all things money, mindset, finance, all of these good topics, I would love to hear a little bit more about you, your story, your journey, where you started, and how you got to where you are today. Well, I'm excited to be on the podcast too, and and, uh, that sounds great. Um, I actually got into the investment business um, about 40 years ago. And I uh, just fell in love with, with two aspects of it. One was the, um, just the helping of people. And, and, and I found our early clients were oftentimes such eccentric people. And, and in a way, although they were living in Cincinnati, Ohio, and not Chile or um, all over the world, people can be eccentric anywhere they are. And, and that was really part of the fun. And then, of course, the excitement of the market and and the ups and downs that go with it. But one of the early lessons I learned was how emotions really can dominate your success, um, not just with investing, but in life itself, of course. And I found that if I wasn't dealing with my own emotions, I wasn't gonna be helping anybody. And so it, it took me on a path of, of looking inward and, and learning from my mistakes. You know, we, we bumble along often in life. And as one of the uh, books I read where the guy right away said, you know, every, mis- every error we make or misadventure is a chance. That's your tuition payment. And you can either accept a lesson or you're going to keep learning that same lesson. And so that, that started me on this path of, of learning and, and, you know, have, have trial and error. And eventually I did write this book called Mellow Your Money because I saw so many people get distracted with the daily you know, excitement, whether it's in social media or in the news, the headlines, and people get so sucked into every minute they've got to be thinking about something. And with, with investing, oftentimes you, um, and as the same fellow said, sitting is often where he made most of his money, that we've lost our patience. And so part of my message is, whether it's, it's your business or it's your investing, we, we need to be patient and, and things don't often come in, in the first month or two or eight or 12, you know, it, it, uh, set a plan in place and let it go. And don't worry about the excitement that the headlines when I, when I provide to you every, every minute. Of this. Yeah, I love this message surrounding money. I don't think I've ever heard somebody talk about it in this way that you have. And I want to dive into that a little bit more because you're so right. You know, we are so used of used to a world of instant gratification and scrolling and everything on demand. And it's yes. great for these companies and corporations, um, but yes. it's not necessarily so great for our mindset to always be on, always be thinking and for our money as well. So can you share some specific examples, lessons where you have seen this in practice within your many decades within investment and yeah, just a little bit of, you know, you've been in this game for so long. I'm curious what some of these lessons that you have learned are that you would want to share. Sure. Well, I'll share a couple. And one is more personal and it has to do with, um, I, you know, when I got into it, I thought I too wanted the short term fix. And you can't get in the, in the investment business and not get enamored with trading and with, with the people who are making it every day. and. And of course, what you read about are the people that are making it. You're not reading about the people who, as one of my friends told me, who are in the bathroom throwing up after they've lost everything they earned. That, that seems to not be the story that we're watching in movies, right? And so, uh, but I thought I'm not going to be one of those guys. So I went to a bunch of seminars and I tra- tried it myself and actually met this trader who was the, apparently the top trader on the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, in that particular year, and he was giving a seminar and he told the handful of us, I'm going to give you exactly what I do to make my money. But I guarantee you that not one of you 
is going to use it. And I'll bet you, you know, in a year. And of course, we're all looking at it and going like challenge accepted, you know? And, and so the, the, the funny part about his method was um, he, he figured out there's, you know, four things that could happen when you, when you buy a commodity or a stock. You can make a lot of money, you can make a little money, you can lose a little money, or you can lose a lot of money. What he took off the table was lose a lot of money. So he said 90% of his trades are actually small losses, but none of them are big losses because he's always taking this, he's always cutting that, that stop early. And so he either has little gains, big gains, or little losses. And those big gains made up for everything. But imagine that you could potentially be losing 20 or 30 trades in a row. Well, he could do that, but not me. You know, I would make an excuse and say, oh, maybe this one will work out. And of course it didn't. And uh, I was left, um, there was, there was my bonus for that year. So, but it was a good lesson in what, what are you good at? For me, I was good at, at helping people invest for the longer term. It was, it was somewhat boring relative to this great trader, but this was my role in life. And so you kind of have to look inward and that's like looking at your own growth and saying, what are you good at? And if it's not trading, well, that's okay. You can still make a good living and help people along and, and, and do good. So that was one of the lessons I learned is, is you've got to look inward and see who you are and wishing you were something else. That, that, that's not going to get it done. If, if, you're, if, you, if you can't throw the ball like Tom Brady, then don't be a quarterback, you know, that type of thing. Then the other yeah. thing I learned was watching uh, one of the fellows that hired us. Um, he, he was a great business person and, and he had made millions of dollars um, on, on uh, it was a small electronic part thing back in the 80s. And um, he came to us and he said, well, now I've got enough money. I just want to invest and, and I want to take it easy. And so he invested with us for six or nine months and then looked at me and he said, you guys are just too boring. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to take my, well, unfortunately a year or two later, he didn't have anything left and he was back trying to start it all over again. And so one of the lessons I learned there is that the same energy that some people have to make money. And he obviously had something, a talent I didn't have. He was able to, you know, start a business, run the business, sell the business and, and be successful. But that same chip that he had is the different chip from saving money. And you kind of have a battle. You have to have a balance there. I, I worked for another business person who used to say, I'll make the money, Nick, you save the money. And so this guy had the balance. He, well, he, he might not have had it personally, but he recognized the importance of it. And so as people, you know, who are listening, who are potentially creating cool stuff online or whatever it is, what I would pass on is, is don't forget to, to save the money too. And, and as you might say in Vegas, take some chips off the table and let it go for the long term and hire a boring guy to, to balance you off. Anyway, those are a couple of stories. I, I definitely do want to dive into saving, making money. But before going there, I have to ask you, you know, you have been in, in the game, in the investment industry game for quite a while now. So how has your investment strategy changed? And I know you may have just alluded to it where you wanted to be fast paced, and glamorize and maybe day trading. And oh my gosh, when I hear people are day trading or learning to day trade, I'm just like, that is a waste of your days, a waste of your time. That is not how I invest. So I'm curious for you how your investment strategy has changed through the years and what that looks like now. Well, I, I, I do believe that um, what, and it, it, this first lesson happened early in my career and it was just watching one of my clients, um, wonderful older lady, uh, but she had, her parents had invested their money back in the thirties. And so, of course, you have the, you know, they're buying the stocks in the Great Depression by the 80s. They had huge gains. And had they sold the stocks, um, you, you would have had, you know, paid huge taxes and just wasn't worthwhile. So you kind of just had to hold on. And of course, if she had something terrible, or, you know, you, you, you might sell that. But by and large, you did nothing. We used to joke it with our strategy of benign neglect. Meanwhile, 
I wouldn't say it was trading, but but in the other in the other uh, accounts that we had, we were moving in and out and trying to time the market a little bit and and such. And um, and of course, at the end of the year, you're kind of measuring who 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 did the best, you know, who performed the best. And amazingly, Eloise nearly invariably outperformed everybody. So by doing nothing, she actually did fine. And it, and it really taught me that oftentimes we do too much. We, we get too excited by, by stocks that, um, you know, have done well and we want to take that profit too early. Imagine you, you uh, bought Apple 20 years ago and, and you were lucky enough to get on there early and it was at $2, let's pretend. I don't know the exact price. And maybe in, in six weeks, it was at $6. And you're telling your friends, I got this stock that went from two to six and you sell it. Imagine the potential loss, the potential money you left on the table by selling out that position too early. And so that was another lesson is uh, it, it doesn't mean we don't take a little off the table, but don't lose your good positions because Apple at 178 or whatever it is today, um, maybe you never bought it back. And imagine that. And so we, we need to be patient with that. And then the, on the other side, though, I've seen people buy stocks that went way up and refused to take anything off the table. And we had a client, really smart people and, and very wealthy, and they had a stock uh, that they bought early in the 80s called Dome Petroleum. It was a, actually a little Canadian company, energy stock. And the thing went like crazy. And I remember you know, the partner went to him and said, you know, we ought to take a little off the table here. And they said, no way. That's crazy. This stock is doing fantastic. You know, they had bought a stock, you know, probably for $20,000 that now is worth millions of dollars. And he finally got them to take off the $20,000 that they invested in. But imagine that millions of dollars in one stock. And of course, then the energy thing toppled in the eighties. The stock went right back to nothing. And Dome Petroleum still is one of those bankruptcies that you might read about in, in a Canadian business school or something. And I'm thinking, God, you know, you, you could take a little off the table along the way and not be so greedy. And so on the, on the one hand, be patient. On the other hand, don't be greedy. And so it's that middle path that I really learned along the way. And, um, you know, that that's at least my style of investing. Yeah. I, oh gosh, that's so unfortunate for them, but I completely agree. You know, you, ha you don't know what's going to happen and we always think it's keep gonna, going to continue to go up, 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 but that isn't necessarily ever guaranteed. Nobody knows what the future looks like. You know, and, and that's actually another fun uh, story I had where, um, not that fun when I think about it, actually, uh, I was at an economics luncheon and the guy asked us, uh, write down, um, a surprise that might happen this year, that year that we were there. And so uh, we're sitting around and it's dessert and he's looking through the cards and he says, war, who wrote down war? And there's this long silence and he's looking around like, what idiot would have written down war? And of course, slowly, eventually I raised my hand and he goes, what in the world were you thinking of? You're crazy. I mean, there's, there's nothing going on in this world right now. And I said, I don't know. That's why you asked for a surprise, you know? And, and so, of course, he had his laugh at me. And uh, unfortunately, six months later, that's when the planes hit the Trade Center. Now, I didn't, I didn't, of course, sell my stocks. I wasn't making a prediction. But that's what surprises will happen to us all the time. Who predicted the pandemic? None of us, you know? And, and, um, and so that, too, has to be part of our strategy is realize that the unexpected will happen and be, and at least have, you know, if you can't take it, you know, if, if, if you know, pretend something weird is going to happen in the next, you know, month, week, year, take your risk level down to, so when that does happen, we're not panicking. And that's another huge lesson for all of us. I'm glad you brought that up is, is realize that we're, no one has a monopoly or, or a great crystal ball. And so, um, but if you have your risk level at a, at a reasonable level, when those things happen, then you're, you're not so scared. You know, when a pandemic happens and you only add 60 or 70% of the 
savings in the in the market, you say, oh, this has happened before. We've had weird things happen. I can I have strong hands. Where everyone else is panicking, you have you have the strength to to get in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What an interesting story. And a great example of you just never know what's going to happen in the future. So I want to ask you now, in the online space, we see so many people talking about what they're investing in and what their portfolios look like. And so I want to ask you, being in this space for quite some time, do you prefer, what do you prefer to invest in? You know, and specifically, I'm asking whether it's individual stocks or whether you invest most of your money in index funds. I guess that, of course, depends on how risky you want to be investing. Uh, but what does that look like for you? What does that look like when a client comes to you? Of course, you're including other things like bonds, um, but just kind of as a general overview without going too granular. Right, right. So what, what I would say is, again, it, it, it's, it's important to look at yourself. And, and I would, you know, there's plenty of professionals you can talk to, uh, whether they're Schwab, Fidelity. I'm not, I don't work for any of those companies, so I'm not uh, pushing anything. But um, you really have to look at what you want to accomplish. And if your goal is to say, put a little bit of your online savings away or whatever it is um, and for the long term, it doesn't hurt to just use index funds or ETFs or exchange traded funds that kind of mirror the averages. You don't have to look at it every day. You just put a little bit away every month and, 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 and forget about it. And it's really a set and forget kind of strategy. But a lot of us can't resist it. And, and even me, you know, Mr. Mellow, your money guy, occasionally has to take a flyer here and there. And, and, and when you do that, that's okay. You know, we should allow ourselves to have a little fun uh, with investing. And, and, but, but always have it in perspective of your whole portfolio. If you take half your portfolio and buy Bitcoin with it, um, of course, if you did it 10 years ago, you're, you're bragging, you're on... You, you, that'll be your next podcast person. But for the average person, we didn't even know what Bitcoin was until it was already up a lot. And maybe you got the last few points of it and, and, and maybe not, but it was okay to buy a little bit of something that's interesting, but keep it in perspective that if it goes to zero, which it hasn't, but if it did, I'd still be okay. So don't let any, if you, if you do use individual investments, don't let any one investment destroy you. And so, and you can blend that. You could have, you know, 80% of your money in a slow moving index fund that's going to bore you to death, but in 20 years be worth something. And then along the edges, take some risk, you know, if, 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 if that's your preference. And, uh, and sometimes that's how you catch an apple or you catch, you know, the next one. I appreciate you sharing that as you know, every, everyone is different and it just really depends on what works for you. I know for me, I, I, I just don't have the bandwidth to, with everything I do in the day to go in and start be analyzing individual stocks. So for me, I like those index funds, but it really does depend, you know, this is what you do, your livelihood and what you enjoy doing, I'm sure is a hobby sometimes day in and day out. So it really does depend on who you are, what you enjoy, and then of course your risk as well. It, it does. And, 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 and in your mind, you've got to play that out as what, what if I did lose anything? But you're right. You've got a ton of things going on. And uh, it doesn't hurt to just put it in an index fund. And when the news comes on, the financial news, you turn on to something else because it's the, the, the headlines are, should not change uh, what you're doing. And, and so that's the other thing is try to get as many of those distractions away from your long-term plan. You mentioned this briefly in your introduction about the book that has come out. And I want to talk about money mindset, mellowing your money mindset and what that has looked like for you working in the financial industry. You know, money is something that you work with every day, day in, day out for decades now. What has your money mindset looked like in the past and how has it shifted? What have some of those changes looked like and how do you prioritize a healthy money mindset when this is your livelihood. This is what you do every single day. And I'm sure you can get so caught up in it to a point where it could become unhealthy. Absolutely. And that can happen whether you're in the business or not in the business. Um, you know, you can, you know, depending on what 
group of people you're hanging out with, they might be talking every day about, about, you know, whatever they're doing. And I have friends that I grew up with and, and they couldn't resist every time they bought something, oh, I got a deal on this or I got, you know, and it was, it was a competition for them. And I, I easily got sucked into that. I, I, um, one of the things I talk about in the book was, was, um, growing up, my dad and I had these, um, almost cage fights of, uh, on the tennis court and the competition was, was huge. And I found as I, you know, entered adult life, competition was important and, and, and that included in money, how much you had, what you did, you know, were, were you doing better than the next person and, and all this, this excess stuff. And, uh, until I worked through that relationship with my dad and, and talked to him and we kind of through therapy kind of worked through a lot of the issues and he kind of fussed joked. We were talking uh, about his dad and, uh, his dad had taught me checkers. And even as a little kid, I was, I couldn't remember three, four years old that he beat the crap out of me. At, and, and, and even at three, you're thinking, well, come on, grandpa, give me a break. And I told my dad the story and he said, yeah, he never let me win either. And I thought, that's karma, man. Or that's like our family had a history and I'm going to break that. You know, yeah. that, that the competition was speaking up. I mean, to me, that that was expressing your feelings was so important. And once I did that and got through that, I realized you don't need to compete with the market. If you do, the market will always win. You know, it's about investing and, and take your, your, your ego out of things. And so uh, learning how to be humble was, was a, has been a lifelong lesson for me, but an important one. And each of us has our own demons from, you know, you, you could have the best parents that are in the world and, and yet you grow up with something that you need to, to deal with and whether it's with your parents or friends or whatever it is. And so. Dealing with emotions, I think, is is something that whether you're working with money or not, if you can kind of work through that, it, it it you can put it in its own place, and you don't. And of course, we all want we need to pay our rent or, or mortgage. We need to to buy our food, and so money can has to be part of what we're doing. But if we can just put it to the side a little bit and not have it dominate us. Yeah, I feel like you know in in today's society. Every, of course, money is everywhere, but it can be so, I don't know if daunting is the right word, where it's so easily on everyone's mind. You go on social media and someone's trying to sell you this and then there's an ad for this and everything, it's money, you're either earning it or you're buying something. And I think, you know, it's very interesting to hear your take and your perspective on the mindset aspect of it, because you can just get completely engrossed in it and be like, I have to be making $2 million a year to afford all of these things and this lifestyle that I want, when things can really be so much more simplified if you want them to be. That, that's right. And, and I would say, I mean, you know, kind of listening to you saying that, I'm thinking it really in, in, it takes courage to be true to yourself, you know, and to turn some of this stuff on. And to say, let them do that. Let them, you know, as you move through the social media thing, you can't help but see that every day. And, and you know, it, it, there was an expression, I remember my mom telling me in the 50s, I don't know if people still say it, the um, keep up with the Joneses kind of thing. So this fear of missing out that we think is unique to us, I mean, we get it more often. Don't kid me. I, I mean, I know that, that in the 50s you were it, but. You had the guy, the neighbor driving his car, you know, his new Cadillac down the street and bragging about it. And that, that emotion um, of fear of them missing out, it takes courage to, to overcome that. Um, but it's not un just unique to our current um, society. It's been there forever. I, I read a great book um, called Sapiens. And the guy was saying that even in the caveman times, there was some snotty teenager messing with his parents kind of thing. And you know, we think these emotions are all us, but it's been going on for, for millions of years. And we just have to find our way of walking the middle path. It's true to ourselves. And, it, and, and, and don't, don't, um, we have to, to take time for that. You know, don't, um, it's so easy to get distracted 
but we've got to learn about who we are and, and what we want to accomplish. And then the other things like money kind of then can fit into its own little niche, in my opinion. So I want to talk about what you alluded to previously, which is saving money and making money and how these are two completely different things. And then I'm also curious, where does growing your money play into this? To actually make money and whether, you know, you think I, I'm, you know, I, I, we just met. But I don't know the risk that you took to move to Chile and to do a podcast and to those are all leaps of of aggressive, you know, you know, moves that that are you know were true to yourself. And when I think of that's the kind of thing that whether it's doing what you're doing, which is true to yourself, or what someone else is doing, it takes I think courage and um, some kind of risk taking ability. To, to, to take that risk, to open the business, to, to buy another business or to take over something else or do something that, that you haven't seen done before, but you woke up in the middle of the night and you thought, I can do it this way. And, and that, that's a fantastic, funny way of, of living. And, um, and that's an entrepreneur. And, and I think, so what I'm, what I'm saying though, is that that aggressive kind of instinct is not the same as the market going down and you've got your savings and stocks and, and you wake up in the middle of the night going, this is terrible. It's just not good. And you, and then you want to go sell everything because your instinct is to take action. And with investing, it's more stick, set a plan, stick to the plan. And, and, and when you wake up in the middle of the night and you say to yourself, well, wait a second, I anticipated this. When things go down and, and I thought I had 60% in stocks and now I've got 50, put a little more money in stocks because that's the plan and then go back to sleep if, if you can. But, but, um, and so, but that instinct of doing something is not the same as investing. And, um, and, and I think it's better. I mean, my own, you know, instinct is that people are better off doing a little of both because Sometimes as you're moving through your business and there's the typical cyclical ups and downs, um, it'll be nice to have a little bit on the side that you say, okay, that's not going to invest. That's going to affect my long-term plan. And so I like to have that balance. I've, that's been the way at least I've played things in my life is, is um, assume that the worst can happen and then plan for both things. And, and, uh, that's helped me calm down. And even when I'm working with individuals, um, I, I think it's helped them. It's not for everybody. Some people just want to throw it all in and, and, and win big and, 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 and they're okay losing big, but you have to be true, but know that going in, don't kid yourself. The cyclic, the cycles have. Yeah. A perfect example that comes to mind for me. And, and you'll know the type of person I am once I tell <laughs> you this story. <laughs> um, so every time I don't go to casinos very often, but I do travel. So sometimes it's fun to go to casinos in other countries. I give myself a limit, you know, like this dollar amount. And it's not, it's not a crazy high dollar amount either, <laughs> you know, because I know that the odds are not in my favor to win. I go to have some fun. I expect what's going to happen. And I know that, you know, likely I, I'm not going to get any returns on this money. And if I do great, or I break even, then maybe I can stop or keep playing. But, you know, I kind of know what is likely to happen. And so I think what something similar, what you just said, where you can do in the markets of, you know, in the long term, it's going to go up. And you know, in the short, short term that you don't know what's going to happen, you know, that you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and so it's really it depends how risk adverse you are, I guess. It, it's a great example, too. And I, I used to say, and I don't, you know, there's my own opinion, but that that long term investing is kind of like you're the house. In other words, uh, if you're willing to stick it out, it will come your direct, it will come your way. But if you're a trader, you're, you're the, you're the gambler, you're, you're the other side, but, but, you know, everyone's worried about in wall street, is it all manipulated or computer trading or whatever? And, um, and I don't know the answer to that truthfully, but I do know this, if you're a long-term investor, it, you don't care because if the computer trading moves stocks too far down, 
I'm a long-term investor. I can buy a little bit. If it moves by investments too high, I'll take a little off the table. And so, um, so you can be on the other side of that gambling table um, if, if you're a long-term investor. If you're not, this, you're, what you just said is absolutely right. We set our limit, take a few chips off the table occasionally. I think the only time I made money gambling I uh, was with a friend and um, happened to, you know, so I'm going to the restroom. I'll be back in, but, but take some chips off. Well, they forgot to do that. And so, and then, and, and they kept set a craps table and it just kept piling up. I came back and the chips were this high. And then thankfully they, I, I don't think they do this everywhere. They closed the casino and they threw us out. I thought, We're, thank God. Thank you. You just let us walk out with money because another hour it would have all been gone probably. Wow. I'm so so surprised that was the outcome. Oh, my gosh. Um, Okay, so within you saying that, I want to talk about getting more into the nitty gritty of saving. And what does that look like for you? What does that look like for your clients? Do you recommend having just some straight savings, putting that in investments, putting that in, I don't know, maybe a different sort of investment, like even real estate? What does that look like? It kind of depends on your style. With with real estate, um, I've not done so much with real estate. I've done a little bit. But to me, that can be just like equity investing. But what I would say is you, it, it's not for free. You know, if, if you find a condo that's, you know, you can rent, um, you have to replace the, you know, the windows if they break and you have to fix the toilets and the roof. And, and no one ever talks about that, which at least when I hear about the great things of real estate, they forget that. There's, there's, you know, the roof will leak and then you got to fix the floors and, you know, all this. And, and then, or, or you've got a, a person you thought was leasing for a year and then you can't find anybody for three months. So you're three months without income. And so real estate, if you're on it, can work. I, I don't want to discourage people, but go into it with your eyes wide open. And it, it certainly over the long term, real estate can make money for you and, and earn income. But, it's not for free. And then the other, on the, on the other side, when you, depending on where you are in your investment, you know, your lifestyle or whatever, to me, the first thing you need to do is put some money away for an emergency. You know, that, that you know, your car breaks down or something goes wrong and you lose your job for some period of time. To me, there's nothing like having some money in the bank that's doing nothing. I would never invest my emergency fund in stocks because I wouldn't want, I, you know, invariably, as soon as you put it in stocks, they go down. I mean, the first thing that happens is, is not the fun thing usually. So once you have that emergency fund and then whether you're going to, you know, tilt towards real estate or, or investments for the long term, I go slow. You do something a little bit every month. You know, I work for a, um, a teacher. She was a third grade teacher in Cincinnati, Ohio. Never made a ton of money. That's all she ever did. But she just kept putting money away and putting money away. And now, literally, she's got her pension from her teacher's retirement and a couple million dollars. And this is not didn't happen overnight. It happened over a long period of time. But you know, with that in mind, uh, that can happen for all of us. But you have to be calm about it. She told me when she was a little girl, she would take some of her allowance money and roll quarters with her mom. And she had, so she had it in her mind to, um, you know, just to, to save money. But, and I, I don't want it all to be about money either. By the way, I, I know what the, the title of your podcast is. You want to enjoy yourself too. And uh, don't dismiss that as uh, that's an important part of life. And it's funny, I worked for this same woman's mom for a while. And uh, she was going to visit her grandkids and, and she was, she said, oh, it's a long flight. And I said, I can't, what, you're not flying first class? I mean, I got on the phone literally with her travel agent. I said, put her in first class. Enjoy your life. And she came back. She said, Mick, that was the best advice you ever gave me. And I thought, me, I mean, all these stocks, all this investing, and my best advice was first class. But, you know, enjoy, enjoy the travels. Enjoy, you know, if you can have that plan with money, 
then move along and, and enjoy your life. I think that is such an important piece that sounds so basic, but it really isn't because we get so caught up in the, I have to have money and my investments and what is the market doing and this and that. But I love hearing that from you of all people, you know, set it and forget it. And so I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you for that's probably like the most important point of the podcast. You know, life is for enjoyment. Work wealth and travel are all fun things in my mind. I love to and it, it, it's it's, about I love that title. That's exactly right. So I wanted to chat about what you just mentioned because it's so funny. You could have been me talking about real estate. Um and it's so interesting because I have various different guests on this show and I recently had one. The episode is not out yet, but he was all about real estate making millions in these huge complexes all over America. And I asked him, you know, what is your perspective on investing in the market and real estate? And of course, being from his background, he, you know what he said. He said right, real right. estate. You being from your background, you're, you're leaning more towards investing. And it's so interesting to me because I have personally always been so much more interested in investing and compound interest and getting the dividends. To me, that just made sense. To me, real estate never made sense for the exact reasons that you mentioned. And of course, you know, there are really great gains that can potentially be had, potentially, but there's so many sunk costs that you just don't necessarily get when you are having, you know, a portfolio of index funds in my personal instance. So I, I found it very interesting that that was what you mentioned, because that's what I say to every single person. And they're like, I'm going <laughs> to buy a house. And in 40 years, 50 years, it's going to be worth double the amount of money. And it's like, well, I don't know the exact math on your specific house, but between the interest and all the repairs, you know, I grew up having parents as landlords for various different homes and having to find tenants and then go to court because the tenants are horrible. And, you know, and a lot of these places too, that most people can afford, especially to get started in the real estate game are not in downtown Miami. So, exactly. you know, you might have to deal with those more unfortunate tenants and the furnace breaking and redoing the roof. So it's funny to me that you mirrored exactly what I say. No, it is. It is, it is exactly like that. And then it's, you know, whether you it's stocks or real estate, there's always that unpredictable thing that you need to deal with at the outset. So you're not totally disappointed when, when those things happen because they will. And, and, and I'm sure, you know. Your friends from the other podcast probably, you know, could tell you some stories of funny stories, probably of bad tenants and bad things. But uh, there's a time and place, you know, there was a time when real estate was, you know, they were, they were almost giving houses away back 15 years ago or in the financial crisis. And, you know, there were times, you know, and, and I'm sure in the market too. Oh, I said, well, you could buy a, you buy a house for this amount. And look where it is. And he said, yeah, you could have bought Apple too. You know, so, you know, at the bottom, you, it's almost like, what's your own style or philosophy that you got to be true to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that you mentioned that because I, I, I think the exact same thing. And I think a lot of people, for some reason, inherently what I have found is people always gravitate towards real estate for investments. And I, I don't know why I think because homes are everywhere and we grew up in one and it were sold the American dream of wanting to buy one. And it, in my opinion, what I have found is investments and what compound interest is and how it works and you know, having dividends and what, like the very basics of investing, not even going into like stocks and bonds and a little bit more complex, but that's just not talked about. It's definitely not taught in any school system that I know, which I would love to see change, but know, uh, we, we see real estate everywhere and we see houses everywhere. So we just automatically default to, oh, those are the best investments. In my opinion, they're, they're not always the best investments, but, but hey, you know, to each their own, just as you said. Exactly. And, and the, but the other thing that I find funny is when people do talk about, you know, I'm out in California now. And so of course the real estate went ridiculous and somebody down the streets talking about, oh, look what our house is worth. And I'm thinking, who cares? We live in our house. So, you know, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. I mean, I could make money if I sold here and moved back to Dayton, but I don't want to live in Dayton, Ohio. I want to live here. And so that it, unless you, you are really going to move to somewhere else and, and do that, which that can be really upsetting. 
the, the house you bought, don't be too house rich and, and everything else poor because you're, you got to live somewhere. And so whether it's worth, you know, a hundred thousand or a million dollars, what's the difference, you know, because <laughs> we got to live somewhere. Yep. Perfect. I, I love that. Okay. So we, we've touched on a lot of different things in this conversation. Is there anything that you would like to touch on that you feel has not been brought into this conversation? I think you really did a great job of kind of bringing out at, at least a lot of the message that I was thinking that that was uh, important to pass along. Um, I, on, a, on another note, I would just like to thank you for having me. And, and also, um, this to me is how people can learn. You know, if you have an hour to, to learn on a podcast versus an hour of watching social media fly by or watching the news, this is how you can learn and, and invest in whether it's investing or enjoying uh, for the long term. I think these, this is a great avenue for people and, and I love it. Um, and it's so much better than, than watching the headlines fly by, which um, can only get us usually angry. <laughs> I think podcasts are an amazing form of education. And on that last note, on you saying that, I have to ask you, you know, you have been in this game for so long. Somebody who is looking to get started investing or maybe they have a small portfolio. What is some advice that you would give to somebody in that situation? So I would, um, I, I think the best thing is you can walk into, and again, I don't work for Schwab or Fidelity, but you can walk in those offices with the smallest amount of money. And, and so the first thing I do is, as I said before, get, get that emergency fund. But let's say you've taken care of that and you want to invest. The easiest way is to buy some index funds or, and, but talk to somebody about what the risks are so you understand. This can go down. The, the first, imagine that first $500 or $1,000 you put in the market and it, and it happened to get you know down 20%. And if you and if you bail out then, you've blown you've blown the, all of the long term things. Understand what the risk is, and I like to go slow. You know, put a little bit. I'd rather put in a little bit every month than just put a chunk in, because then you do have regret. And so have a habit of just investing a little bit consistently, and then you don't care. In fact, one of my old colleagues said when I was younger, he said. We'd be better off if the market went down for the next 20 years because we're, we're putting our money in the market. So don't be afraid to put the money in the market when it, in that month that the market's down, put, maybe even put a little more in there because you know the next month you're going to keep doing it. And so having that happen it also takes the thinking away from things. You don't have to wake up in the middle of the night wondering what you're going to do. You know, on the fifth of the month, I'm going to put a little more money in the market and forget about it. And, 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 you know, in many years, it'll turn into something. Yeah. It's so interesting. And you saying that I, I always thought, and this was when I was quite a bit younger, it never made sense to me why nobody thought the same. And I was always like, when the market is down, it's on sale. Like this is what I want to buy. It's like a great shopping discount and nobody around me or, or nobody that I was seeing in the online space when I was, you know, 20 years old, they, we're having the same responses to that. And I was just like, how, how does this not make sense? Like if it's something, you know, not the most speculative stock in the world that just, you know, just IPO, not that stock, but if it's an index fund or exactly. the S&P 500 or something very safe, it's like, why would I not want to buy this? This is on sale just and keep... it is going to go up. <laughs> exactly. In the long term, you're better off. That's why it's almost you close your eyes and you keep the same, it is a funny thing. At the grocery store, you automatically buy the 20% off thing, 20% off in the stock market. And everybody's going, no, 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 it's going lower. And and, and, um, and that's where we've got to just keep to our plan and forget about it because you're absolutely right. And it is different with stocks. But if you own individual stocks and something looks out of control, it's like it goes down with the market. You think, oh, I don't, I'm okay. But when it when a stock starts acting ridiculously bad you think there's something i don't know and i need to move away but i agree with with you in general for most people you own an index fund 
you don't worry about that risk. It gets watered down. Yeah, that's that's how I like to keep it personally. I don't want to be worrying about anything. I don't want to be waking up in the middle of the night, you know, having like, oh my gosh, I need to check the, the stock and what's it at. That's, that is not my style. I do not have time for that. No, but. you'd rather check, check the travel to some other country or something, so... Exactly. Exactly. Well, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. It's been amazing talking on all of these different topics with you as an expert in the industry. So where can people find you online, Mick? I think the best place is uh, my, my uh, book website is www.mellowyourmoney.com. And uh, you can find my email there or and, and happy to chat with anybody. You've just listened to the Work, Wealth and Travel podcast. If anything from this episode resonated with you, I would appreciate if you share this podcast on your socials. And of course, be sure to tag me. And don't forget to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me on this global citizen journey, and I'll see you in the next episode.